Hi, uh, welcome to our program. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, a professor of pathology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. And our program is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, which is a joint venture between Path Presenter and the Digital Pathology Association. Uh, our program today is focusing on a, a fairly simple diagnosis uh, or uh, differential that uh, comes up, which is the topic of polyps uh, involving the endometrium and cervix, so gynecologic polyps. Um, and this is a fairly common uh, problem uh, or presentation. Uh, in fact, uh, for endometrial polyps, it's estimated that up to 10% of women uh, may have endometrial polyps at some point during their lives, usually in the uh, uh, premenopausal age group, but oftentimes involving a postmenopausal uh, period as well. Uh, cervical polyps, a little bit less common, uh, maybe two to 5% of the polyps, uh, but a higher percentage of these may harbor some sort of premalignant lesion, 2% uh, of those polyps which are removed. Now, these are not high numbers, except that when you start multiplying them out by a significant uh, portion of the population being involved, uh, it can mean that uh, uh, in your daily practice, in the, even some of the less uh, busy settings, you're very likely to encounter uh, one of the malignant diseases uh, in this situation. Now, cervical polyps usually present with some sort of bleeding or discharge, uh, maybe with abnormal cytology and so forth, whereas uh, endometrial polyps usually present with a somewhat different uh, presentation, uh, maybe infertility or abnormal bleeding. Sometimes just a mass lesion is detected uh, on exam or sc screening uh, uh, process and so forth. Um, and each of these have their own relative differential considerations. Uh, smooth muscle tumors can uh, protrude and produce polypoid masses. You can get placental site lesions actually in either location. Nebothian cysts in the cervix can present uh, as a polypoid type mass. And of course, endometrial polyps can also uh, prolapse down into the cervix and have a predominance of uh, endometrial tissue, uh, which uh, underscores their origin. Uh, and then, of course, in both circumstances, polypoid neoplasms uh, enter the differential considerations as, as well. And that's why it's very important to be uh, aware and uh, also to examine these uh, lesions uh, fairly carefully. So uh, what do I think of when I think of an endometrial polyp? Well, uh, the things that I'm looking for and which uh, I will often uh, find maybe uh, only some of are, first off, thick-walled blood vessels. So these thickened, uh, rather in, enlarged vessels with a, a somewhat muscular wall uh, are indicative of uh, uh, the possibility of uh, a uh, uh, endometrial polyp. Now, uh, these are felt to be uh, due to a uh, disconnect between the hormonal cyclic responsiveness of the glands as opposed to the stroma. Uh, and in fact, it's been demonstrated that the stroma does have a uh, less uh, uh, stringent affinity for uh, hormonal stimulation, and that uh, may be part of what leads to the relative uh, overgrowth or polypoid uh, dis distension of these lesions. Uh, so this uh, alteration between the glandular appearance and the stroma, uh, the latter of which is uh, usually much more condensed and uh, is definitely not responding to hormones in the normal manner, uh, can be quite helpful. Now, of course, we know that there are other areas of the endometrium where the uh, stroma may not be quite as responsive as well, the basalis and so forth. So this is not an absolute criterion, but when coupled with other findings is uh, helpful. Uh, the least frequently encountered uh, change is a, a true polypoid architecture where you can see a sort of a three-sided uh, uh, epithelial line surface and so forth. But if I've got a couple of these uh, features, I will say at least suggestive of or consistent with uh, an endometrial polyp, uh, provided, of course, that we've excluded the things that can look like that uh, that are more serious. Uh, on the other hand, well, let's take a look here and just uh, demonstrate here with this example from the digital slide library of the DAPA. So as you can see, this does have sort of polypoid architecture, so it fits that criterion. Um, the stroma looks different. We see areas that are quite condensed here, other areas that are more hyalinized. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, reflective of the uh, postmenopausal 
uh, age group of this uh, woman, which is also manifested here in the glands. As you can see, the uh, epithelial lining is uh, quite attenuated. There's very little uh, cytoplasm to these uh, cells, uh, relatively cuboidal or flattened cuboidal even. Uh, but together with the uh, thickened blood vessels, the altered stroma, uh, and uh, the obviously uh, abnormal architecture, uh, we certainly can uh, say that this is uh, consistent with a polyp. Now, in a premenopausal woman, of course, you can back out the glandular dilatation. Maybe you'll have some variable uh, glands that look uh, a little bit uh, more altered and so forth. Uh, but you still should find the uh, abnormal vasculature uh, and uh, the uh, altered stroma in that uh, setting. Um, so things you should be uh, looking for to make sure that they're not here, of course, is any evidence of epithelial proliferation, uh, particularly any uh, evidence of high-grade nuclear features that can be a marker for serous tumors. Um, and of course, uh, muscular changes to the stroma, uh, squamous morial formation, other sorts of things in here that indicate that your uh, polyp has uh, other features uh, that would not be expected in the usual endometrial polyp. Now, in contrast to this, with uh, endocervical polyps, uh, you know, the clinical history is actually very helpful here because usually these uh, are directly visualized uh, and to the uh, colposcopist, they look like there's a polypoid mass. Uh, now, age is also important because, uh, again, these are usually adult lesions and in a pediatric patient, you shouldn't be seeing a typical endocervical polyp. That's much more likely to be a, uh, a neoplasm. Likewise, in a uh, non-hormonally cycling age group, postmenopausal, again, you're more likely to begin to pick up uh, uh, neoplasms. You can find thicker walled blood vessels that often feed these, uh, but these tend to be more sort of mucosal prolapse type of processes uh, where the, the mucosa is just uh, uh, hyperplastic and so forth. The, the, the three-sided architecture can be very helpful as well. Um, but, and again, usually with uh, two or three of these, two of these uh, criteria, uh, you can be uh, uh, perfectly fine with the diagnosis of uh, endocervical polyp or consistent with endocervical polyp. Now, because of these are exposed uh, in the sense of uh, being uh, protruding into the uh, cervical os, you very often can get some degree of squamous metaplasia or inflammation, or as even you see here, uh, a, a glandular proliferation with neutrophils and uh, watery clear cytoplasm, basal vacuolization that is characteristic of uh, microglandular hyperplasia. So let's take a look at one of these or a couple of these in a more uh, definitive setting. So here's a clearly polypoid architecture. Uh, we can see that we have uh, squamous uh, metaplastic epithelium overlying the glandular architecture. Uh, but we're not seeing a good central vessel, at least in that uh, cut of it. Uh, and here, uh, maybe here we can begin to suggest that there may be a vessel here. It's a little bit hard to distinguish. Uh, but we're certainly beginning to see nice microglandular hyperplasia. The neutrophils and the mucin, the watery, uh, clear, vacuolated cytoplasm, especially basal vacuolization, very characteristic of this lesion. And it should not be uh, confused with uh, endometrial hyperplasia or uh, pre-neoplastic lesions. I think in the next uh, slide, we've got a little bit better uh, view of the vasculature that you can see in there. Here's a nice uh, feeding vessel, a little small muscular arterial there. Um, and again, you've got some degree of squamous metaplasia, some chronic inflammation because of the exposure there. and here you see some superficial neutrophilic exposure to the squamous mucosa, again, uh, indicating irritation. Uh, and I think over here, we even have still a little bit more of that uh, microglandular hyperplasia, uh, which we showed on the previous slide. So there's a couple of good examples of uh, uh, these lesions and kind of some of the findings that you can expect. So um, there are a couple of things that should be ruled out. Uh, so, especially in these younger patients, you want to make sure you're not dealing with a botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma. 
Uh, so if something looks eroded and inflamed, that may be fine, but you want to make sure that you're not dealing with a cambium layer of a sarcoma. Likewise, adenosarcomas can have a polypoid protruding uh, appearance, either from endometrium or from uh, the endocervix. Uh, and especially if you've got a very low-grade stroma with just minimal atypia, you could easily miss these. Uh, serous carcinoma, more uh, typically a problem in uh, postmenopausal patients uh, with very focal involvement either by frank serous carcinoma or uh, endometrial intraepithelial carcinoma, uh, which we have talked about in previous videos. Um, smile, other HPV lesions occasionally could uh, be present in polypoid lesions, uh, but not, uh, not terribly commonly. Um, atypical polypoid adenomyoma, where you're getting uh, squamous morules and <clears throat> adenomyomatous uh, stroma with uh, some degree of atypia is also a possibility. And then rarely endometrial stromal neoplasms that may pull along a few sparse glands uh, can also have a very polypoid appearance, uh, either from the endometrium or rarely from the uh, endocervix. So I've got a couple of these to just review with you. So here's a polypoid mass. <clears throat> you can see the uh, surface hyperemia and so forth. But in this case, we've got a little bit of uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> altered differentiation with some chondroid tissues. Um, and as you look at this stroma, it shows a, a much higher degree of cellularity, atypia, mitotic activity, uh, along with these very benign glands that have become entrapped with that. Uh, so uh, a very inflamed and eroded surface, but underneath that surface, a cellular uh, neoplastic proliferation uh, with the, the telltale heterologous elements, uh, in this case, that indicated a, a uh, embryonal rhabdomyosarcoma. Now, some of the botryoid tumors may be uh, more uh, demitous and just have a very thin uh, layer of sarcomatous tissue uh, along the surface. Uh, uh, subepithelial uh, surfaces. Oops, we've already talked about this one. So here's another uh, example, uh, this of an adenosarcoma. Um, and here you can see uh, this uh, appearance, uh, polypoid fragments, yes, indeed, uh, fairly bland surface epithelium, but then this condensed uh, stroma, uh, which is mitotically active, uh, and has a degree of atypia, uh, but you'll see here it's fairly low grade. Now, the differentiator here, the thing that's helpful, is this transition to a much less cellular uh, central stroma. Uh, but you can see how this could easily be mistaken uh, for uh, an endometrial polyp or even an endocervical polyp in some situations. So being aware of this uh, <clears throat> sort of phylloides-like uh, pattern of uh, benign glands, uh, leaf-like stroma, uh, leaf-like fronds of tissue, uh, and the condensed stroma beneath the glands uh, is the uh, clue to uh, not missing this uh, lesion in your differential considerations. And then uh, finally here, uh, again, a postmenopausal patient, dilated glands and so forth. Um, and this is why you should uh, thoroughly submit these lesions, especially in the postmenopausal patients, because these kinds of changes, as you see here, uh, with high-grade cytology, a little bit of necrotic debris, uh, these can be very focal in these lesions. Uh, and yet, uh, despite their seemingly in situ character, uh, this lesion can present with uh, disseminated intraperitoneal disease uh, and that's not something you want to uh, miss on your uh, curatage or polypectomy sample. So uh, be aware of the uh, focal potential of intraepithelial uh, endometrial, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, endometrial serous carcinoma uh, to uh, hide amidst the uh, atrophic uh, glands and appearance uh, in a polyp. So those are a few concepts to uh, think about as you contemplate and deal with uh, uh, polypoid endocervical and endometrial lesions. Uh, and these are common lesions, but they're not always simple to diagnose.
uh, especially if you have not uh, carefully ruled out the other possibilities. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, discussion. Uh, please be aware that the uh, digital slides are available for you to review. Uh, the link to those slides is in the uh, comments uh, uh, description of the video, which I hope that you will uh, latch onto and take the time to uh, study in, in some uh, detail. Uh, and as always, uh, we welcome you to subscribe and, and encourage you to do so so that uh, you'll catch future releases from our channel. So uh, until next time, Thanks so much for joining me.